Welcome to I Believe, an exclusive web series for the Harbor Assembly of God's online campus. Thank you for joining us today as we journey into God's Word. In this world, we can be flooded with misinformation and half-truths. And we have to ask ourselves, what is truth? That is what is at the heart of this web series discovering more of God's Word so that we can understand what to believe. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you are a God that encourages us to learn more about you and to find the truth for ourselves. I ask that you'll be with us today, that we will learn all that you have for us. Amen. Have you ever wondered what to believe? In a world flooded with misinformation and half-truths, what is truth? What are we to believe? What are the foundational truths of Scripture, and how are they applied to our lives? In this series, we are going to discover the powerful fundamental truths by examining the words of our Creator. This is I Believe. Last time on I Believe, we covered the salvation of man, how we are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ and set free from sin. In today's episode, we will be covering the audiences of the church. Now, I had a lot of fun making this one. There, even though I knew what the audiences of the church were before writing this, there were little things I didn't know, like what exactly an audience was. And I think that is a great place for us to start. What is an audience? The technical definition of audience is a piece of legislation enacted by a municipal authority. In other words, someone who is in charge of a city, town, or the governing body makes a law and enacts it and says, we are all doing this thing. If our mayor of our city says, new rule is that no one can throw trash out their windows anymore, then we all must follow this. And that is what an audience is. So what are the audiences of the church? Well, they are, they are things, they are religious practices that we have been instructed to do by Christ. And why is this per se an audience? Why isn't it just a rule or a teaching or a following? Well, we are God's children. But more than just that, and more than just being his creations, we are his people and we are his citizens of heaven. Ephesians 2.19 says, So you are no longer strangers, and outcasts. You are citizens belonging with God's people. You are also his family. 
So we are we are more than just God's people. Oh, we we're just Christians. Oh, we just go to church. No, we are we are a family and we are also citizens of heaven. And as citizens, when our ruler, who would be God, who would be Jesus, gives us a command, that would be an audience. And we believe in two religious practices that Jesus ordained for us to do and what we call the audiences of the church. That would be baptism in water and communion. So let's start off with baptism. Why baptism? Well, to start, let's cover what baptism is. For those of you who are joining us who might not know, or those who may need a refresher, baptism is when a believer has decided that they are going to give their life to God, that they will leave behind their past sins and follow in the footsteps of Christ. When they do this, they, are, they typically have a pastor or a priest or a spiritual leader pray over them before submerging them completely into water and raising them out again. There's a very good reason as to why we do this. Now, if you were like me when I was younger, I thought we did this, well, I was taught that we did this because it showed that we've accepted Jesus, so we are dirty with sin, we go under the water, and we come out clean the way that we are washed away of all our sins. And that's part of it. I was also taught that it was just simply an outward showing of an inward change. That we are just showing on the outside something that's already happened inside. And again, I'm not saying that's not true. But why do we actually do baptism? Is it simply because we were told to do it? Well, yes, I'm... Sure, that's part of it. We were told to do it, so we do it. But why? Is it because, you know, that there was this really cool guy named John and he was baptizing people down in the river and so we got to keep this really cool trend going? I, I don't think that was it. We are baptized because it shows us identifying with the life and death of Christ. And let me explain. Christ took our sins onto the cross with him and bore our sins the way that we have sin. When we go under the water, it is we are identifying with the death of Christ, how he died and was laid to rest in the tomb. And just as Christ died and laid to rest in the tomb, we die to our old nature and to our sins. And when we are pulled up out of the water, it is a representative of how Christ was raised from the dead. He did not stay in that tomb. He rose up from that grave. The same way that we rise up out of the death of our old nature and become something new in Christ. I think Romans 6, 4 puts it perfectly. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was risen up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in the newness of life. I think that is just the perfect explanation for what baptism is, that we die to our old selves, and like Christ, we are buried with him and we rise up as something new. That is truly beautiful. So, why do we say that this is an ordinance? Why do we, why do, we do this? Did, did Jesus just say, okay, I was baptized, so um, you guys should go do it too. So baptism is great, but I want to go one step further and ask, why do we still do baptism? 
why do we have to be baptized by water and not just accept it in our hearts and move on? Well, what makes it an audience is us is God telling us, hey, go do this. Now, I have I've heard a few people say in my lifetime before that the things that Jesus told his disciples to do doesn't necessarily mean we need to do them. So, it, you know, that was something just for past then. And I won't get into every instance and every detail, but I will tell you that baptism is something that Christ instructed even us to do today. Matthew 29, 19 says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in water, in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So if he told his disciples to go and teach all the nations to do this, why doesn't that still apply to us today? And that is why we say that this is one of the two religious practices that was ordained by Christ for us to follow even today. The second one is communion. Now, this is one that I really liked doing most of all. Like, I knew what communion was, but I'm a big definition person. I like to find out what exactly words mean and try and see how all the little pieces tie together. And when I was doing research on what the word communion actually means, it just, it made me happy. The definition of communion, not the act of it, but the definition of the word is the sharing or exchanging of intimate thoughts and feelings exchanging intimate thoughts and feelings especially when they are when the exchange is on a mental or spiritual level i think that is just absolutely beautiful because it gives communion something something more to it it is more than just a just more than just a eating crackers and juice it is a deep, meaningful exchange. It is a very vulnerable moment and it is an exchange of true emotions and feelings between us and our creator and between us and our savior. It is way more than just you sit in church on Sunday and eat crackers and juice and you say a prayer. It is something that is, that is just heartfelt. It is real raw emotion and it is a special moment shared on the night Jesus was betrayed, he was having supper with his disciples. He took the bread, blessed it, and broke it. He said, this is my body, broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. He was not saying that the bread itself was his physical flesh, but that it was a representative of how his body was broken for our sin and that he shared it with everyone and said, when you eat this bread, remember me and remember the sacrifice that I made for you. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which has been poured out for you. So when Christ went onto the cross and died for our sins, a new covenant was made that we no longer had to pay that penalty for, for sin, which the only penalty for sin is death. So when he, when he took, that, uh, took our sins to the cross, he took that penalty away. And when he's saying, this, this cup is representing my blood, which is this new covenant poured out for you, he's saying that, that you know, you drink this in remembering and understanding and celebrating your freedom in this new covenant that was for my blood. You are taking, you know, it's not actually his blood. You're, you know, we're not just sitting here drinking blood. So no one here is a vampire. But it is a representative of that we are being covered by his blood 
that broke the old covenant and we are living under the new covenant. Now, the, and you know, he told us to do this and that's what makes it an audience. He said, eat this in remembering me, you know, drink this. He was, t he's telling us to do this and remember his sacrifice that, you know, celebrate in our new found freedom that is in the co new covenant of him. And it is also a proclamation of his second coming, which this is a new one. I actually have heard this before, but never actually got into that part of it. I am not sure why, probably because the Bible's big and there's a lot to read on, but this was always something that seemed to have gotten skimmed over a lot. And so it was really interesting to look at that we not only are we remembering his sacrifice for us and we are celebrating the new covenant, but we are also proclaiming his second coming because he promises he'll return and we know that our God keeps his promises. 1 Corinthians 11.26 says, for, when, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So this is saying that, you know, more than just the first two, that whenever we do this, we're also proclaiming that our God will come back. I believe that this verse also shows how this, how communion is also a co uh, audience. It's because it says, whenever you do this, not the one time you do this, or in the past when you have done this, make sure you do this, or when that one time comes that you do this, you know, make make sure that you know that you're proclaiming that the Lord's second coming is will be here. It says, whenever you do this, the multiple times that you do this, and Jesus says, to eat this bread and remember him. So this is what our second audience is is to have that that raw beautiful moment of communion with him of where it is just we share our emotion with him and he shares with us and we remember what he's done for us we thank him for what he's done for us we celebrate that he is alive and that we are excited for his second coming i i think that looking into more of these audiences have just really it just always makes me so much more excited for the god we serve because he thinks everything through and everything he does is for our good and every word that you read is just showing how much he loves us you know he doesn't just he doesn't just tell us hey go jump in a river he says i want you to identify with who i am i am ordaining you to go and to identify with who I am and take on my nature and be covered in, in my sacrifice that I've made for you. I want you to take these moments where you stop, remember me, remember what I've done with you, done for you. And I want to have a beautiful moment with you, a real emotion of where we are sharing and exchanging our true thoughts and feelings for each other. And his thoughts and feelings for you are just that he loves you. And that these were not my notes. I just get very, very excited when I think about how much God loves us and just how amazing he is. And the sacrifice that Jesus made for us, how much undying love that has to be. And so when I read that these audiences, they are ordained or things that we have been commanded to do, it's not a, oh gosh, I have to do this. You know, these are audiences of the church. Be a part of the church. I have to do them. I'm excited to do them because we aren't just told to maliciously do these things. We are, we are told by someone who loves us very much to do these things for him. And I am happy to do them for him. And it just further shows how, how great and how wonderful our Savior is. Okay, now I'm done with my little tangent. Let's, uh, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your goodness and your greatness and your love. I thank you that 
that you care so much about us that everything you do is for our better and to just get closer to us. Lord, I thank you that we are not only just, just your creations, but that we are your family and that we are the citizens of your kingdom. I ask that you will be with each and every one of us as we go about our week. In your name we pray, amen. So thank you for joining me today. I believe, once again, is an exclusive web series for the Harbor Assembly of God's online campus. I really do thank you for joining us today. And I hope that you have just the most amazing week. God bless. Thank you.